uh, we'll make a start. So thank you all for coming. Um, obviously, you're the guys who couldn't get into the, uh, the blockchain talk, so uh, sorry about that. Litigation funding, tips from the experts. Um, if you want to move down from the back row, that would be fine. There's plenty of room at the front. We can, we can make it more inclusive. We want this to be more of a discussion, so at any point, if there's anything that you feel strongly about, ask for the microphone and uh, interject and join the conversation, and, and this is a conversation. Just as a start point, and before we introduce ourselves, can I just ask for a show of hands, who's actually used litigation funding? Okay, so 50% so of the audience, so that's, uh, that's pretty good, thank you. Right, well, so the tips from the experts, they couldn't make it today, but we're here in their stead. Um, my name's Mike Savile, um, I'm an insolvency practitioner, so I, I, I sort of adopt the role of liquidator and court-appointed receiver, etc., and often get involved in litigation, and that's where I've come across litigation funding to mitigate some of the, the risks that I face when I'm responsible for an estate. I suppose my other interaction with litigation funding is I was re appointed court-appointed receiver in the Cayman Islands of a, a litigation fund. And that was probably, together, actually David was involved with that as well. And that was probably, aside from an alleged fraud that was involved, it was probably a case study in, in how not to do litigation funding. But principally, my interest is a, as a user. So let's just hear from the, the rest of the panel as to uh, where, they, where they sit in this. So good afternoon. Uh, my name is Sanjay Desai. Uh, I've been in the AT and funding industry for a good few years now in various capacities, working in-house uh, insurers, AT litigation insurers. Uh, I'm now global head of AT and funding for Marsh, uh, where we broker AT and funding for all scale and sizes of deals across a number of jurisdictions. So uh, having worked in various capacities for insurers or as an insurer linked to a funder, I've sort of seen the, the various things that can go wrong and right with funding and, and ATE. I'm David Herbert. I'm a commercial litigator at Lock Lord uh, here in London. Um, and my involvement with funding principally is advising clients uh, and working with my clients to um, work out whether a case needs funding, ought to be funded, uh, and sometimes have done that with success, uh, and ha have a number of funded cases. Um, a lot of my cases are also traditionally self-funded too, uh, with client paying. Um, I've also been involved in cases where litigation funding has gone wrong, and acted both for and against litigation funders when that's happened. My name's Charlie Morris. I'm the Chief Investment Officer of a litigation fund called Woodsford Litigation Funding. Um, I am also a lawyer. I was previously in private practice at Adelshaw Goddard and Enyo Law, and I moved into funding about three years ago. Uh, to, to kick off, um, I appreciate that half of you um, have already used funding before and therefore will be very familiar with what it is, but I'm very briefly going to describe what it is so those of you in the room understand what we're talking about here today. Um, third party funding is where a third party provides the funding to a litigant, normally the claimant, in order to, in order to allow that claimant to pursue a legal claim. So the funding might cover legal costs, including the solicitor's fees, the council's fees, and then other disbursements. That's the traditional idea of litigation funding and where it all started. Nowadays, though, it's developed into a form of finance for more than just litigants. So, for example, law firms are starting to take funding from litigation funders as another form of finance, uh, and IPs take it a lot in order to pursue uh, the litigation claims that the insolvent estates might have. Um, so there are many, many different forms, so it can best now be summed up as the provision of capital where the return is based on a contingent asset in the form of litigation or arbitration being realised. Thanks, Charlie. Okay, so as a start point, I suppose what we, what we really wanted to, to look at was with the range of funders in the marketplace, it, it, hardly a week seems to go by to me when, when there isn't a new entrant to the market. 
how do I, how do I actually select the right funder for me? What sort of criteria should I be looking at? Where, how do I assess that fit? Yeah, so, I mean, that's, that's obviously a good starting point. There are so many funders in the market now. There's about 30 operating in the UK alone. Plus, outside of that, you've got in, uh, hedge funds, PE houses, investment banks looking to put money into funding, even uh, family offices looking to put money into funding where it's not their main business. So there is a lot of choice out there uh, and a lot of options. And, and what's interesting to note is a number of things to think about when picking a funder. Um, you know, every funder will have its own risk appetite. Uh, some will only want to fund, you know, five million pounds minimum into a case. Some will put a million minimum into a case and some will put no more than a million into a case. So there are different investment appetites and ticket sizes of what they want. Um, and also types of claims. Uh, so there, there are some funders that only like arbitration, some that won't go near arbitration. Um, so the t some that specialize in insolvency, there are, there are different strands to think about. So every funder will have their own sort of risk appetite uh, and appetite for ticket size um, when, when looking at it. And the other thing to think about is, is, how, is you know, how good are the funders, their track record. So there's the Association of Litigation Funders, which, which Woodsford are a part of, uh, where they're sort of self-regulating really and have rules around liquidity. So you know they're sort of good for the money. But then you have people, funders that sit outside of that but have a good track record, but you know, there are questions to consider there. Um, and track record of a funder is a good one as well. Um, you know, I think that's always important because if a case goes wrong, you need to know that the funder's gonna stand by you or if budgets overspend, uh, the, the funder has the ability to continue to put capital in. And then actually where the funders get their money from is, is another one as well. And, and I'll let Charlie talk about that in a minute, but you know, funds raise their money in different ways. So some will get it from institutional money, some will be backed by a family office, uh, some will you know, have different ways of raising capital, and that will impact how a, a funder can spend their money. Um, you know, some, for example, may have restrictions based on the capital raise of what types of cases they can put it in or how much can go to a certain case type, but, but, but a number of factors there um, to consider. I was going to add to that. Um, and I think you also need to think who are the, you know, who are the funders and what are their processes? Are they lawyers? Are they lawyers in the jurisdiction in which they're funding? Are they lawyers in a diff different jurisdiction? Are they bankers? Are they uh, fr from some other uh, industry? Um, a lot of the funders in the market now will employ um, former uh, English or English qualified solicitors, English qualified barristers. Um, I think if you're dealing with that kind of funder, you can be more confident that the fund is going to understand the case and invest in it in a kind of broader sense, not just invest money in it, but, but be invested in, in, in understanding what the case is about um, and isn't going to suddenly um, lose enthusiasm when a security for costs application comes along, when disclosure gets difficult, when some other aspect of the case that they hadn't understood uh, arises. So I think that's something to bear in mind. And then I know we're going to talk about this a bit more later on, but I think it's also worth bearing in mind what are their processes in terms of obtaining the funding? Um, how detailed is the due diligence procedure? Um, it may seem, as from a litigant's perspective, that, um, that it's not, uh, that, that jumping through too many hoops from the outset is unhelpful and it might be uh, tempting to go for a funder that's got fewer hoops uh, for the litigant to jump through, but there can be dangers in going for the uh, easy money too. Um, again, if the funder isn't really fully invested in the case, doesn't understand the case, hasn't done the due diligence for the case, then there can be some nasty surprises for the funders which ultimately doesn't end up helping the litigant. I'd really just echo what Sanjay and David have said. It, it, our industry is one that has attracted a lot of money over the last few years, um, and that is largely because um, investors have heard about the kind of returns that are being generated uh, in an asset class that is uncorrelated to the capital markets. So um, as uh, investors decide that capital markets aren't producing what they need to, uh, they start to become more interested in putting money into litigation funding. 
uh, and to give an example of the kind of thing that David was alluding to, that might involve a New York hedge fund that is not staffed by litigation lawyers taking the step to try and invest in litigation when really they don't understand the asset class that they're investing in. Um, they do have lots of money, but that money might dry up, that appetite to fund might dry up if, for example, they're halfway through a legal case and they're hit with a security for costs application and they have to get their head around what adverse costs are because they don't have them in the US. So the two things that um, I think are sensible to look for from a funder are money and the appetite to see a case through and also being staffed with uh, lawyers who will understand the kind of case that you're asking to be funded. Thanks, Charlie. So, um, one follow-up question on, on that, that whole area. If we didn't have Charlie's contact details and we, we've never used litigation funding before, what's the easiest way of finding a funder? Maybe, Sanjay, you could deal with that. Well, obviously, working for a broker, I'd say find a broker. That's, uh, <laughs> that's got to be the obvious question. Yeah, come um, direct. But, uh, but I think, yeah, but I think... Um, I think there are other ways. I think a good starting point is, is ALF, the Association of Litigation Funders. Um, you know, litigation funding is an unregulated industry. Um, but obviously, one thing that you get from the Association of Litigation Funders is there's this kind of self-regulation and that they adhere to some quite high standards, actually, right? And, and Charlie, you're involved with ALF, so you can sort of talk yeah, about Yeah, no, that. so there's, there's a code of conduct. Uh, there is no external regulation for the litigation funding industry, but a, a certain number of funders have joined this association and signed up to a code of conduct, which is a form of self-regulation to, uh, to make sure that we have enough money, uh, that there are um, boundaries within which we act, and if there are complaints against funders, they can be made to the association. Okay, so... I'm a chartered accountant and I'm an insolvency practitioner, so my whole life is focused on risks. And I always get worried when someone wants to give me money to do things. Um, so this is a large piece of litigation. Um, you're prepared to give me a lot of money, but there are risks on both sides, and I appreciate that. There are risks for the funder. There are risks for the, for the client, for the borrower. What sort of risks do we ne really need to focus on? What are the key areas we need to focus on here? What should we pin down? I think two of the key risks are, well, first, there's, there's the risk uh, in terms of loss of appetite and or loss of capital or, or unavailability of capital. And I think that is the kind of the, the most key risk for the claimant is that somehow or other they will find themselves in the midst of proceedings and perhaps there's been a budget overrun, perhaps there hasn't been a budget overrun but the funder loses appetite and or hasn't, simply hasn't got access to the capital. Uh, so that's a, you know, a, a pretty nightmare scenario, and I think that is why it's very important to, to pick the right funder from the outset and one who you're confident has got the appetite and confident uh, has, has got the capital too. So the, the, um, the Association of Litigation Funds, Funders uh, has a code of conduct that actually includes standard termination provisions that funders can include in their LFAs. And two typical ones are if the funder reasonably believes that the claim no longer is economically viable, it can terminate the funding agreement. And if the funder believes that the merits have gone south, and the claim is no, likely longer, uh, no longer likely to win, then the funder can terminate as well. Um, there is a strong disincentive against funders terminating because if you terminate, you quite often will lose the money that you've invested until that point. And so it's not a step that funders take lightly, but it's nonetheless something that can happen. And, and that first part is, is quite important. Obviously, Charlie mentioned funders can pull if the case is no longer economically viable. So if you're putting £2 million into a case that you thought was £20 million, the case now looks like it's worth £6 million. Well, quite frankly, that's not going to leave enough for the funder's return, probably leave nothing for the client. So if, if suddenly damages, for whatever reason, plummets, and that case is no longer... The, the metrics aren't the same as when you set out on that journey, that, that's a risk to the client, actually. And that's a key part of 
your application for funding, making sure your quantum is right. Uh, before you even, before a funder will look at the, the merits of a case, they'll look at, you know, one, is a defendant good for the money? Because obviously everyone's got to get paid at the end of it. Uh, but two, do the economics work? And I think that, that's, a, that's a risk that clients need to be aware of and be alive to and try and address really at the outset. Just going back to the, um, the risks, uh, because we've looked at the risks from the funded party's perspective, but there are risks for a funder as well. We're ultimately the ones parting with our money. And uh, as part of our due diligence, we will look very closely at the claimant themselves because that they will be our contractual counterparty. And we need to be able to trust that they will continue with the litigation, that they are motivated in the right way. And by that, I mean that they're motivated to extract value from the litigation rather than um, motivated by an emotional vendetta, for example, like some claimants are. And then there is a risk that um, when a claimant realizes that um, perhaps the return from their case is not going to be as significant as they thought it was, they might seek to circumvent their obligations to pay the funder the success fee. Typically, the funder will sit at the top of a waterfall of distribution of funds that are recovered, and therefore the claimant stands the prospect of getting nothing sometimes if everything is eaten up by the funder in Sanjay's scenario of a, a £6 million claim and £2 million funded. Uh, there is actually a, um, a very real-life example where one of our competitors uh, lent money to a, a gentleman who pursued his former solicitors uh, in a claim of professional negligence. And the claim uh, went all the way to trial and succeeded on liability, uh, but the uh, the quantum that was awarded by the judge was only a tenth of what had been claimed. So he awarded three million instead of uh, 30 million. And uh, the quantum of the order was appealed to the appeal court, but before the um, appeal could go ahead, a settlement was reached where the final sum was increased from three million to three and a half million. Uh, but here's the rub. The settlement was done in secret, away from the funder's eyes, and the litigant uh, had the money wired, instead of to the English solicitor's client account, to his client account in Curaçao in the Caribbean. And uh, he relocated his life out to Curaçao and uh, did a full-page spread in, in the Times about how the funder could come and get him if they could. Uh, so there are, there are risks to bear in mind as a funder. So one of the concerns for me in terms of, of risks as, as a user, and this, this arose certainly in the context of, of being a, a court appointee in the Cayman Islands, was being able to demonstrate it was me taking the decisions as the court appointee and that it wasn't the funder who was effectively pulling my strings. So how, how do we get that balance right? That's a big risk for me because I've got to, I've got to have that credibility. It's got to be me and my lawyer. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure uh, David and Sanjay will have points here as well, but as a funder, uh, we are not allowed to control the case. Um, there is a public policy, certainly under English law, that we're not allowed to do that. Um, we... Um, you know, through termination provisions, we have a level of indirect control over whether or not we provide funding to the claimant. But in terms of the decisions in the day-to-day -day case, they are always taken by the claimant. Charlie, do you have any particular concerns there in terms of third-party costs orders? Well, as a funder, we have potential liability for costs in any event, so that's how we look at every single claim that we fund. Um, we will want to have uh, adverse costs arrangements in place if the regime provides that we might be liable for adverse costs at the end of the day. What about the confidentiality issues? Obviously, huge sensitivity around a lot of this litigation. How can I be sure that you're not going to, your systems will be sufficiently robust that, that this information will not seep out to the other side in any way? So, typically, we enter into an NDA before receiving any information, whether that's through a broker, uh, if Sanjay brings it to us, or, or directly with Lock Lord, if David were to bring it to us. And that gives the user of funding some comfort that their uh, 
uh, material is going to be kept confidential. I think that goes back to the point of which funder do you choose as well, because if they're staffed by lawyers, then they fully understand the issues of privilege and confidentiality, and they're more likely uh, not to be waving documents around Mayfair um, like some funders might do. Yeah, so I think you're absolutely right. And um, in cases where we invest, where that we see circumvention as a real risk, um, then we will insist on measures such as putting the other side on notice that the only way that they can effectively settle this case is by making a payment to the English solicitor's client account, for example. Um, but if the funder in that case did not take those measures, then it is something beyond their control. But for funders... Um, our funding globally, you know, one type of case that we and our competitors invest in is investor treaty arbitration. And quite often, um, the investor will be from a far-flung jurisdiction, and the state that they're pursuing will also be a far-flung jurisdiction. It's all very distant from where the funder's headquarters might be. And so in those particular circumstances, we do need to be very careful that the investor and the state, for example, don't do a deal away from the eyes of the funder. Thanks. So I think those of us who've met a number of funders will have experienced situations where people say, well, we can give you a decision to fund within 24 hours. That always makes me really, really nervous. On the other hand, I've also dealt with funders where there are weeks and weeks and weeks of form filling. Where should that right balance be? How quickly should we expect to be able to advance to a, a first decision point? And what would that decision point look like? Um, yeah, it's, it's a good point, actually. Um, funders have different methods and process, and the other panelists make really good points about who's staffing these funders. Um, so even with some funders, for example, they have incredibly bright lawyers and sometimes there's a tendency to want to out-lawyer the lawyer on the case or bring them the case. Um, always wary of funders that offer you a quick decision. I sort of liken it to um, an online mortgage in principle type decision. You know, they say, yep, you can have funding. Well, of course, in principle, anyone can have funding, but there's a whole level of due diligence that has to happen before, you know, a funder parts with £2 million. Um, and that's what's going to take the time. So I think deals can take, you know, I've seen some deals complete within four weeks. Uh, I've seen some deals complete, you know, nine months down the line with one particular funder um, who takes a long time but offers a quick decision. Um, what I would sort of caveat to that is the other thing as well, some funders will try and lock a client into exclusivity. So what they'll say to you is they'll come back to you quite promptly and say, yes, you know, we like this case, we love it. They've not really done a great deal of work on it. This is roughly what our terms going to look like because those are our standard terms. Uh, and then you'll like that. You'll like your, you know, within the first week, you'll like the quick response, you'll like the numbers, and then say, oh, but we'll complete our due diligence. You'll get the impression it won't take a long, but we need to lock you into exclusivity for like three months. Uh, and and that, a risk to a funder is, you know, they don't want to do the work and be beaten out by a competitor. That's kind of a risk for everyone anyway in any market, in any business. Um, but, but that's something to be mindful of when, it, when, a, when a funder offers you a quick yes, just be careful of that exclusivity period. Um, but I think one of the things that makes a difference, I, I don't think there's a hard and fast deal should take this long to complete. I think one of the things that makes a massive difference is actually how it's presented to a funder. And I'm sure Charlie will, will offer some really good insight on this. But if you hand over a funder, you know, a, an email with 20 attachments, none of which are labeled, none of which, you know, tell you what they are. There's not real much of a summary. And you say, oh, I've got counsel's opinion. It says it's, you know, it says it's a great case, got 60%. That doesn't really do a lot for the funder. But if you're suddenly presenting a nice electronic bundle, you, you've clearly got a content, you've got all your, all your things labeled, you've got a nice data room with everything segmented, a nice case summary. And if you're presenting it to the funder in such a, such a good way for them that they can make sense of it easily and quickly, that's going to help the whole process. Uh, and I think that presentation piece is really important in how long it takes for you to look at a case, right? I'm sure Charlie will add to that in a moment, but just um, from going back to the exclusivity point, 
And I think um, a key point is to try and tie up as many things as you can in principle before entering into exclusivity. Make sure the funder's investment committee has seen the case and approved of it in principle. Make sure just even some basic things that the funders run conflicts. Uh, what you don't want to do is be tied up in exclusivity and then be told, well, there's a conflict or we don't, the, the investment committee doesn't like these kind of cases. And it might sound basic, but I think you need to take things as far down the line as you can in principle uh, before entering into exclusivity. Um, because th you know, then you can find you're tied in that process for, well, for a long time. Yeah, f funders are aware that this is the biggest bugbear of users of funding, that, th that they provide an application for funding and sometimes it goes into a black hole and it takes forever to try and get funding and all they ever receive is endless questions or, or, or forms to fill in. Um, I think one of the most useful things that a lit litigation funder can do is give a very quick no if they're not interested in the case. Uh, and sometimes funders won't do that and they will drag their heels uh, and give you a no after two months, which I, I understand can be very frustrating. Uh, but Sanjay is absolutely right that um, how quickly we can turn around uh, an opportunity depends entirely on what information is provided to us and in what form. Increasingly, we are receiving approaches directly from claimants um, partly, I think, because they don't want to pay their lawyers to seek funding for them and they think that they can do it themselves. Uh, but if you present a claim to us that has scant legal analysis, it's going to be very difficult for us to get comfortable with it without asking a raft of questions um, and p potentially repeated uh, rounds of questions. And so often in those circumstances, we will tell an applicant for funding to go away and do X, Y, and Z, instruct a law firm, have a legal analysis carried out, and then reapproach us uh, with, a, with a better packaged opportunity. Yeah, and I think there's a couple of things that could just be closed off quite early by a litigant or by the litigant solicitors fairly easily before it even gets to a funder to save it being bounced back to you. Uh, and it comes back to what I was saying earlier. So firstly, is the defendant good for the money? Regardless of how good your case is, if the defendant has no money, it is not getting funded and there's no value in you pursuing it. So that's something that, you know, litigants can, can cover off quite easily and quite quickly, right? Yeah, I mean, often, often it's not even about whether the defendant has money. It's about where the defendant's assets are. Yeah. Um, lawyers, no disrespect because I am one, um, will we'll often focus on very clever legal arguments that will get them a very nice judgment at the end of the day. But unless you can turn that piece of paper into money, it's of no use to a funder and no use to a client either. And uh, enforcement and recoverability is almost the most important part of the chain that we look at. And so if a, if a defendant is very wealthy but only has assets in Indonesia, I can tell you very quickly we're not going to fund. Yeah. And also, even if the assets are in a friendly jurisdiction, actually a bit of work around what's the enforcement strategy because that's going to have a cost as well. A time element, because the fund's going to want their money back and their return back, uh, and there's going to be a cost to enforcing against those assets as well. So is that built into the initial budget that you're asking for, or is that extra money, or do you have a separate strategy? Go on. So, so what are the um, usual return expectations for the funders, and, and how much do they vary between the various firms? You can answer that. Do you want to answer first? Sorry, I didn't, I didn't hear the question. What's the usual return, like the, the one thing? Um, so, the usual return for funders is changing all the time, and I know that's not very helpful. Um, you will have heard a market standard being bandied around, potentially, of three times money. Um, so, for every pound spent, uh, the funder expects that pound back, plus another three pounds of success fee. Uh, that level of return, how, however, is, is coming down as competition amongst funders increases. Uh, price is, is being driven down and that's no no more apparent than in Australia at the moment where class actions are being advanced by law firms and funders that have to go through a beauty parade before the Australian court where they all compete on price uh, and more or less the court then decides which is going to be the most price beneficial for the claimants and chooses that law firm and that funder to carry on. So it's a moving feast, but uh, 
The three times multiple is what you might expect to get if the matter runs all the way and you spend the entire budget. And if it settles earlier than that, you can expect your funder to offer you a, a cheaper return, whether it's one and a half times or, or two times or two and a half times. And all, funds are, and all funders will take different returns. You know, some, some funders will be, uh, you know, I'm working on a deal with a, a well-known, um, well, where, we've, where the client's gone direct to a well-known funder that's perhaps had some accounting issues publicly recently. And they're asking for their money back plus six times on this particular deal. And the client, Magic Circle Law Firm, think that's, that's a great deal. But, but it's, it's, it's not. They are by far the most expensive. And that's, that's obviously why they've now come to me to, to get out there and, and find a, a much better deal that's more in line with market rates. Um, but also then there are other things to, to consider as well. So all funders firstly have a different appetite for risk. Then they have a different remuneration structure. But then actually there's no real typical what does a funder take. So some funders will take, the money, take a return based on what's committed to a case. So if they commit a million, they might want their million back plus another three. Or they'll do it based on what's drawn down, what's actually used of that money. So some funders will take it based on if only half a million is spent. So that's another thing to factor in. And, and it comes back to the earlier point about these risk factors, right? Yeah, and the other point is, is that funders can also seek a percentage of the gross proceeds. And it might be the multiple or the percentage, whichever is higher. Or you can have lesser of models where it's the lesser of a percentage or a, or a multiple. So it really does vary from case to case. And it is bespoke, certainly the way Woodsford does it, based on the risk as we perceive it involved in that particular opportunity. And how the risk shifts throughout the case. And the funder will generally want, well, may well want to um, have lower multiples at an earlier stage in order to incentivize the claimant to settle. And obviously, if there's a settlement, that reduces risk entirely for the funder. The, the thing which is odd to me is that, it's, that it's, it seems to sort of, the time value of money is built into it rather than being, you know, 18% a year or whatever. Yeah, I'm not quite sure why um, litigation funding pricing has developed the way it has. It's never been an annual or either, even a monthly rate of interest that has been applied, uh, in my experience, save where um, a law firm enters into a, a law firm finance facility with a lawyer, with, with a funder, in, in which case there might be a percentage charge per month. Um, but, but that typically just hasn't been the way that it's worked. Yeah, I mean, in the lower end of the funding market, so, you know, where people need investments of up to, say, half a million, for example, that would be considered a small investment for litigation funding. There are some models which are based on an interest-type model. Um, but also in the, in the bigger ticket stuff, you know, if you're going to put out five million and put that five million out of risk, it, it's like anything. You've got to structure your portfolio of investments in a way that the winners cover the losers. So I suppose that's partly the driver for the slightly higher returns, right? Yeah, and well, one thing... You know, if, if you're thinking in the pure hedge fund sense that if you need to commit five million to a case, you need to ring fence that five million. Uh, and so even if you've only spent 200,000, you've still got 4.8 million sitting idle. And so even if interest rates were to be charged, you might have an interest rate charged on the amount used and then a different rate charged on the amount committed but not used. So there are various different ways you can do it. And actually, if you're a sophisticated user of funding, you'll find that some funders are open to negotiation not only on the amount of the return, but also on the structure of it as well. Uh, I think we've got a question over here. Thank you. Um, given the fact that these relationships are not regulated and that there is a chance that the claimant, the funder, or the solicitor, any one of those th three could, could do the dirty on the other, how important is it that the judge who's issuing the cost order um, is aware of the funding agreements of both sides. Is that a standard thing in UK courts that that sort of disclosure must happen? Or does the judge basically make a cost order in a vacuum and kind of hope that um, you know, the, the parties will do right by each other in that respect? Okay, thank you. Do you mean the, uh, the damages award? Damages award, correct. Ordinarily, it would be in a vacuum. Um, so what really it comes down to is the, the, the legal relationship between uh, the litigant uh, his lawyers and the funder and the the funder will be reliant on the lawyers who will be tied into that agreement to police it um, and can have a large degree of or hope they can have a large degree of trust 
that those lawyers are not going to do the dirty because they are regulated uh, and have got a lot to lose if they do. Um, so, so, so I think the funder takes a large um, element of um, comfort from, from tying the lawyers into those agreements. Yeah, I mean, I, whilst the funding industry itself is not regulated, we operate in a highly scrutinized environment where all of the solicitors or lawyers that we fund have their own regulators um, and their own professional duties. And then they are bringing matters before courts where judges uh, give judicial oversight to um, the arrangements that are going on. And going to your question of disclosure, um, there's no mandatory disclosure in the English courts or in many other courts around the world of litigation funding arrangements. Uh, but there is increasingly an international arbitration. And part of the rationale for that is that there are, there is the potential for conflicts between arbitrators who are hearing the case and funders who quite often have arbitrators or for, former arbitrators working on their investment advisory panels. Uh, so that's one of the rationales as to why disclosure has been found to be necessary in arbitration, but perhaps not in, in court. What, one way, I should add, one way in which funding arrangements might come to light is if the defendant makes a security for costs application and or makes an application about, against the claimant for, to reveal the identity of any funder that it has so that uh, the defendant can make an application for security directly against the funder, which is what happened in a, um, in a recent case brought by Stuart Barry Wall against RBS in relation to interest rate swaps. Uh, I guess, for what it's worth, um, my view is we're going to see more regulation in terms of the litigation funding industry. We're, it's, it's, a relatively, it's a relatively new area. Um, I don't know, 15 years, 20 years, we, we've seen litigation funding. And in the early days, it, it didn't really have much traction at all. And what we've seen across all areas of funding is increasing regulation at a significant rate. I don't see why litigation funding will be any different. Whether it will, will actually improve anything or help anything or provide any assistance to those using the funding, I, I, honestly, I probably doubt, but I think we'll see more regulation. Yeah, so there have, been, there have been very few reported problems with litigation funders. Most of the, uh, the cases where there are disputes uh, are normally because the funded party has done the dirty on the funder rather than the other way around. Chris? Yeah, thank you. My name is Chris Johnson. I lived in the offshore world for 50 years. That's why I look so old. Um, litigation funding, I believe, probably commenced in Australia uh, and then more recently in England, and now the Americans have latched onto it. Um, so far, we've been talking about funding in the United Kingdom, where I see we do have a, an association, a code of conduct, which I hope does apply to Burford Capital. But um, notwithstanding that, what are the advantages of using uh, in Cayman uh, and other offshore jurisdictions a funder in the UK rather than a funder uh, in New York? Good point. <laughs> They're going to pass it around now. <laughs> well, well, I think the uh, Association of Litigation Funders and the Code of Conduct is one reason. Um, I touched before on the idea of using money from a New York hedge fund. Um, it depends really, I think, on the nature of the case that you're bringing in Cayman. You know, what is the governing law of that particular uh, action? Uh, are the lawyers from a, an English funder likely to understand the core assets better than lawyers in the States? Is there an adverse cost liability? Because if there is, English lawyers in England are likely to get their heads around that better than American lawyers. Um, it, it really is horses for courses, depending on the, the type of case that you want funding for, I think. Because there are plenty of um, reputable operators in the US and in Australia, just as there are in the UK. So I'm not advocating for English funders over American funders. It just depends on the circumstances. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's spot on. Also, um, culturally as well, you know, how, a, how a, an American litigator runs something to, uh, 
to an English litigator, just, just at a very basic level, you might, might assume the American litigator is much more aggressive than the American funder um, than, than the English funder. They might have different approaches and style uh, to terms of how they view the, the progress of the litigation and then the enforcement of it. So Charlie's right, it's just horses for courses really, um, rather than saying one Con jurisdiction over the other. do arise because you have a hedge fund in the Cayman Islands with feeder funds in the United States and uh, offshore feeder funds and you see prospectuses going out in the States, subject to, uh, sometimes subject to uh, American law, more often than not subject to American law. Um, I should add, in my experience, because the entities are, are Cayman, an onshore feeder, sorry, offshore feeder and a, a master fund, that because of the <clears throat> laws of the Cayman Islands, basically based on the UK laws, and so I think that's more palatable to the uh, UK funders rather than the, the US funders. Yeah, so um, you will be aware that there are many funders out there now who are global. So Woodsford has an office in the US just as it does in London. And we, are, we have a number of our um, staff who are American lawyers. So in that kind of circumstance where you have a mix, it's sensible to go to a funder who has expertise on both sides of the Atlantic. Yeah, I, I guess practically from my point of view, I, I would be reluctant to use, I'm not saying I'd never do it, but I'd be reluctant to use a UK funder on a purely US piece of litigation and vice versa. I think if the, the funder basically um, has an awareness and branches in both territories, that, that's a different matter. But, but when it's just unique to one area, I, I'd have a, 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 a gut reaction against it. Well, yeah, I think the, the problem with that, Mike, is on a hedge fund with a master fund in Cayman and an offshore feeder yeah. and an onshore feeder, you've got two worlds there. Yeah. Although I have to say, I think most of the time the action takes place at the master feeder level, feeder, uh, the, sorry, the master level rather than the feeder. The, the other thing to note is that um, the, the concepts of charity and maintenance existed in Cayman. And that's something that won't make a lot of sense to an American lawyer, but it will to an English lawyer. And, and you now have to go through a process, as I understand it, in Cayman in order to have court approval of your funding arrangements. Uh, and again, that's a step that perhaps an American litigation funder wouldn't be too familiar with. Okay, thanks. Um, Another question there? Oh, really good, lots of questions. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Austin Peets. I'm involved in a tangential business, so please excuse the, the schoolboy question. I'm involved in due diligence specialising in Russia and the former Soviet Union. Um, but I have a, a tangential external question, if I may please, and it does pertain to regulation as well in light of recent events in the market. So I think it's no secret that Burford Capital is coming under attack from muddy waters regarding its various accounting policies. Um, to the extent comfortable, could you just comment on that report a little bit? I think possibly, hopefully more of interest to the insider practitioners in the room. Um, what changes in general terms have you seen inside companies since that to risk models or valuation models or, or um, balance sheet models and what regulation could be reasonably expected further from here because it was obviously quite sensational. So um, this, this kind of issue that has arisen at Burford can happen in any listed company as far as I'm concerned. Um, how a company values its assets is governed by accounting rules and there's a degree of discretion as to how that's done. Um, and it doesn't matter whether you're a petrochemicals company or a litigation funding company. When you're on the public markets, you have uh, obligations to, um, to value your assets in, in a fair and reasonable manner and in accordance with account accounting standards. Uh, what has changed at Woodsford since the news about Burford broke? Nothing, because we uh, value our as assets conservatively in any event. But we can see how this um, kind of problem has arisen because a litigation funding asset is a relatively new thing. And even accountants struggle with exactly what the correct way to value those assets is. 
Because if you value them at cost, like some litigation funders do, i.e. just the amount that you've committed to fund, then you are undervaluing them. Because actually they are assets that could generate a return of up to three times, or four times, or six times. So to value them at one time is what you're putting in is not a fair valuation. To value them at the top end of what you could receive from that asset is similarly not a fair valuation. And so you then have to find somewhere in the middle, and that's where the discretion comes in, to value your assets. And so I think there is some defensibility to um, a litigation funder's position that it's very difficult to carry out that task. And the question uh, that I think it's raised more than any other is whether litigation funders are suitable for the public markets or whether uh, it's more appropriate for private investment by sophisticated investors. Charlie, what's the uh, ALF saying about this? I mean, clearly it is a very difficult asset class to, to value. And I mean, going back to your uh, suggestion that you have to value somewhere between cost and, and, and total return, well, there's also the, the, the possibility that any of these cases may end up losing and actually represent a liability. Absolutely right. Um, what's the ALF saying about it? Um, not a lot to my knowledge, but I'm not on the ALF board, so I don't know if there's been a discussion that I haven't been involved in. Um, I, I think the, um, the way in which funders account is governed by the IFRS accounting standards and not by any standards set by ALF. And so any discussion that has taken place in ALF, I'm not sure what relevance it would have in terms of whether funders should change their practices. I think Charlie's right, though. It is difficult to account. Uh, and obviously, the Muddy Waters report was uh, definitely an eye-opening one for many people in the market. Um, and I think it highlights that you know, to anyone, whether you're a hedge fund, a PE house, a retail investor, high net worth family office, litigation funding is not the easy ride that a lot of people think it is when they think they can just chuck in a million and make three in a couple of years' time. You know, and I think that's one of the issues with litigation funding, actually, in, in terms of a lot of people think it's an easy way to make a quick and big buck on, on, a, small return, on a small investment. Um, and I think that's one of the dangers. And I think that's one of the good things that's come out of the Muddy Waters report in that it's, it's highlighted the risks um, associated with funders, both like we've been talking about, for funders and users of funding. Yeah, when there are um, accounting scandals or, 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 or questions over whether accounting has been done in a correct manner uh, and a company's market capitalization drops significantly, you, you'll often see a shareholder's class action follow on very shortly thereafter. So an action has already been commenced against Burford in the States by shareholders seeking to recover their losses that they've suffered. I don't see it as very different from the shareholders that are suing Tesco currently, trying to recover their losses from the accounting scandals that happened at Tesco. I actually think the industry that Burford's in is irrelevant. It's about how any company in any industry on a public market conducts itself. What, um, what this does raise, I'll, I'll come to you in a second. What this does raise, I suppose, is, is the issue we were trying to get to before, and that is how long does the funder take to actually lend money to the borrower? But however long that is, what we shouldn't forget, and from my point of view, is the borrower should be considering does he want to borrow money from that funder? And, and that isn't, you know, that, that shouldn't be taken for granted. You, as a borrower, you need to understand who it is you're actually dealing with. Um, what can you find out about the funder? And uh, th there's such a sort of range of different litigation funders out there. And you really need to do your due diligence. And, and certainly I've had at least one situation where I became very concerned about well, a couple of different issues with, in, in different situations. In one case, it was the source of those funds that were being lent to me. Um, and th that only became clear as we were going through levels of discussion to try and frame the litigation funding agreement. But, you know, I got very nervous about some of the questions that, that were being asked to me and some of the ones that were being reflected by, by me to the funder. So you've got to take that into account. Um, in addition... It's, has that funder really, in your opinion, you're the borrower, has that funder got the money to see this litigation through to the end at the end of the day? Because a lot of people will promise a lot of things, but how many people are they promising it to? 
So there's got to be some confidence in, in the funder systems as well. Now, I know there's a few questions out there, so, so um, hand, any hands up there? Yeah. yeah, so I had a question, and that question is, uh, do you guys uh, ever sell claims, trade them? I mean, if, you, if, you, if you're holding a, if you're holding a, a claim... We, 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 we're often asked uh, whether we will monetize a claim um, in, in the sense that we will uh, fund its prosecution but also buy out the claimant and, and give them an early return. Is, is that what you mean or something different? No, that's not what I mean. What, what, what I mean is, um, will one litigation financing, financing firm buy a claim from another one, i.e., is it, is it a traded asset? Uh, yeah. I've, I've never heard of it being done outright, um, but one thing that might happen is uh, two funders might uh, co-fund a case, or one funder might be funding a case, and they might seek to sub-fund 50% of their commitment to another funder. Um, and they might do that for capital adequacy reasons, they might do it because they have a concentration of risk in one particular case. And where they sub-fund in that way, they might get a carry on the return of the sub-funder and so they're actually making money out of the subfunding process as well. Yeah, and the reason I ask is because that would justify marketing it to market. Otherwise, I don't see how you market to market. There is, there is, a, there is a secondary market. Um, so Burford, for example, have, have sold an interest in a couple of claims. Um, and that was actually part of the issue around some of the accounting as well, uh, some accounting issues. But Burford have, have publicly uh, sold interest in a couple of claims uh, and made a return. So just as an example, these aren't the numbers, but, you know, they had a £100 million in potential interest in the case where they had invested £10 million on. They then sold that to a hedge fund for £70 million. Because the hedge fund thinks, hey, these guys have done the due diligence, great, they were for 10, why not, why don't we sink in 70, we're going to make 30 in a, in a couple of years. So there is a secondary market, but it's very, very nascent. Uh, it doesn't happen very often, and it doesn't happen very publicly either. Um, and more often than not, it happens with awards rather than claims that are yeah. pre-judgment pre or pre-award. So the Burford example was, a, was an award, yeah. an arbitration award made against Argentina, yeah. uh, which they sold to a hedge fund. Yeah, and it's typically awards. And actually, that's something generally claimants can sell their awards. Um, but it's, it's, as Charlie's correct in saying, it's not necessarily pre-award that that happens. But, but I actually like your, your, your interpretation of my question better. Um, the litigation costs $3 million, but you, but you think that, that, that you're going to get a $20 million judgment and you feel good about it. Do, do you ever uh, finance the, 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 the judgment? It's rare, um, partly because we want to keep the original claimant involved because they're the ones who have the factual knowledge about what went on and the basis of the claim. And if we just buy the guy out and he walks off into the sunset with his 10 million and we're left pursuing a claim for the 20, um, there are significant risks associated with that in our view. Um, we've probably got a lot more to say, so we'll probably have to come back next year, I would think. Okay. But. Um, Given the, the room next door, or the competitors, as we like to call them, has ended, we probably ought to think about ending it there. If there are any other questions, happy to take them. Um, if not, thank you for, thank you for listening. <laughs>